Hello there and welcome to this week's Granny's Garden. Now before I start, just take a moment to appreciate how beautiful these amaryllis are. I planted them just four weeks ago on the last video I did before the break and just have a look at them now. Four weeks and beautiful, beautiful, loads and loads of flower stalks. I can't wait for Carmen, this lush red, velvety red variety, to take centre stage. Now I'm going to leave Carmen to one side because she's totally distracting me. And let's get back to the subject of this video, which is attracting even more wildlife to my garden. Now I love wildlife in my garden and there's nothing better for me than to spend an afternoon or a morning weeding, listening to the birds singing and the bees buzzing. It's absolute heaven for me. So I'm always on the lookout for ways to attract even more wildlife. For my sparrows, which indeed in this country is an endangered species, here in my garden it is definitely not an endangered species, but I have to do my bit for the country, I have a bird feeding station. I have two bird feeders and a bird bath. Now I buy the best seed I can, and they're totally spoiled. They congregate in the nearby trees, especially in the olive tree and in the actual prunus, the cherry tree itself. And as soon as I put seed out, they come in like in flocks to feed and gorge on those seeds. I also refresh the bird bath. It's very important not only to have access to water, but to have access to clean water. In this country, it's very important as well to change every day because in summer, well, starting from springtime onwards, you get the mosquito. And the mosquito will lay its eggs in still water. And because it's not a current in a bird bath, I need to be changing that daily to break the cycle of the mosquito. And in winter, I have to break up the ice and put lukewarm water in so they always have access to water. Because I say, there is snow, there is ice, but there isn't very much freestanding water to drink from here in winter. Apart from my bird feeding station, I also have nesting boxes. Now I have two in the pine tree. One faces north, the other faces northeast, and I'll talk about that later. And from day one, they have been inhabited by sparrows. They absolutely love them, usually producing one, always, two usually, and sometimes I've even seen a third brood on that nesting box throughout the growing season, or throughout the nesting season. So today I'm going to add one more. Now the only problem I've had with the nesting boxes I have is that to clean them out, you have to take the panels out, each panel out, unscrew it, the two panels, clean it out, and then remount it, reassemble it. So the one I've got today makes that job just a little bit easier. Now this is the nesting box I'm going to be installing today. Now a word about nesting boxes. Some people think they should have a perch here. They don't need it. This should be inhabited because of the size of it, the size of the hole should be inhabited either by blue tits or by sparrows. All you're encouraging putting a perch here is that a praying bird could sort of perch there and then try and stick its head in and pull out any of the young babies. A sparrow or a blue tit will fly in, hook on there with its feet and then hop straight in and hop straight out. You do not need a perch there. It does more damage than good. Secondly, it must be made out of solid wood. None of this agglomerate. Good solid wood and untreated wood. The other important thing is what you want to attract. There are holes of 28 millimetres, 32 millimetres and 45 millimetres. The 45 will be something like for a starling. The smaller ones will be something like blue tits. And the intermediate ones will be either sparrows or a cold tit. Something slightly bit bigger. The other thing is drainage holes. At the bottom, they always must have drainage holes. A slanting roof. So that the, the rainwater falls and runs off and doesn't accumulate on top. Nail it or screw it to a tree trunk. It must face either north or east, so it either gets no sun at all, no direct sun, or just the morning sun, because these can overheat quite easily. So position on a tree is very, very important. Now, the problem with the existing ones I've got is that they have two panels here, and to clean them out every year, because they have to be cleaned out every single year, I have to unscrew the whole thing and unmount it. This, on the other hand, has got a better design. You just push that down or push it up, Open it up and you can easily access, you can see the two drainage holes here in the bottom. And when you finish cleaning it out, pop it back, close it up and that's it until the following year. Now the other thing I love when I come to clean it out every year is to find out what they've been using to line the nest. Now basically the actual base of the nest is usually the same, it's like small twigs or like a straw like grass. But to actually line it, that beautiful lining that keeps the eggs nice and soft and the chicks nice and warm, can be things like soft grass cuttings or maybe feathers, downy feathers. But in my case, I found they've been using things I have around my garden. Now, I have a German Shepherd mix, Boston. And anybody who has a German Shepherd knows that they have this like woolly undercoat. And they do molt. And I found when I opened it this year, they had lined one of the nests 
with Boston's woolly undercoat. The entire inside of that nest was lined in a beautiful, soft, woolly coat. The lining of the second nesting box, however, I wasn't too pleased about. Not this winter, but the winter before was this famous winter where we had blizzards followed by Arctic blast. It was really, really cold. So I had harvest guard on top of my most delicate plants a long, long time. And I had found that those little birds had been pulling off little bits like this and had lined their entire nest with all of these Harvest Guard nice warm cloth. Very intelligent on their part. I had to end up throwing it out. It looked like a lace curtain by the time they'd finished with us. So before moving on to the next garden element, a brief summary. Nesting boxes are extremely important. What they're made of and how they're made. Solid wood, untreated wood, slanting roof, the whole the correct size. We do not want a starling being able to poke its head into a blue tit's nest or a sparrow's nest. Preferably with no perch. Easy access, either unscrew the panels or like this, very easy access to be able to clean it out and disinfect it every winter. By the end of February or beginning of March, it should be cleaned out, disinfected, dry, never use a chemical spray or a bug spray. Just leave it as it is. Closed, closed, no nesting material, leave them choose what they want to nest in. Location on the tree, north or northeast, never west or south, where they can literally cook inside, especially if the country's hot. Now, the next thing we're going to have a look at is this is a bee hotel. You can get them in all sorts and shapes and sizes. Many of them are divided into sections. Some have like, like little pine cones, uh, pine needles, little bits of grass. I prefer to centre on one thing. I don't like to be jack of all trades and master of none. So if I'm getting a bee hotel, it's going to be a bee hotel. So it's going to have lots and lots of hollow tubes so those bees can look for the diameter they want and nest there. Another important thing when you're getting a bee hotel is depth. Mason bees like tubes that are at least six inches deep. And many of these bee hotels, if you flip them on the side, are only four inches deep, which is not deep enough for them. So look for something that is at least six inches deep. Now what mason bees do is go to the very, very end of the tunnel or this hole Put some pollen and put an egg there and then they raise a wall, which is why they're called mason bees, made out of mud. And then they go again, pollen, egg, wall, pollen, egg, wall, until they get to the very end and then they cap it off with mud and they seal it like that all winter. Then those are going to hatch, they're going to go through their first life cycle inside that and then come the first week in March, the actual mason bees, the leaf cutters know the leaf cutter bees come out slightly later, will eat their way out and they're going to be alive, if the case of a male, for two to four weeks, in the case of a female, for or four to eight weeks. And then the cycle begins all over again. These bee hotels are a great way to introduce both your children and grandchildren to insect life, especially bees. Mason bees don't have to defend either a queen bee or a colony, and that's why they're not aggressive. The males, their sole point in life is to mate with the female. They don't even have a stinger. The female does have a stinger, but she goes about her business. And it's only known to sting if you get hold of them and squeeze them. For goodness sake, who's going to get hold of a thing and squeeze it like that? You wouldn't wonder they'd sting you. Of course they would. But you leave them alone. You can brush against them, fly past them, and they won't even touch you. Brilliant way. And then a young child can get up close and look at what's going on. See it flying in and flying it out. And if you're lucky, maybe even seeing it making that mud wall. What a great way to learn. Now, the first thing I'm going to be placing is the actual bee hotel. It doesn't have to be on a wall. It can be on a wall, a fence, a tree, but it always has to be south facing and with nothing impeding that flight plan. Those bees have to be, have easy access in and out without any overhanging branches or any obstacle in the way. I've chosen the tree. This is a ball pine tree. It's nice and wide. It'll take it. Placement, as long as it's four foot upwards, you're fine. Four foot downwards, no. It's got a nice metal clip here, so I'm just going to screw it straight onto the tree.
enjoyed this video on attracting even more wildlife into my garden, it won't take very long for them to cop on that I have put up free lodging for the birds and the bees. They'll come in in droves fighting over who gets the new box. Regarding height, in the bee hotel, somewhere between four to six foot off the ground. If you're looking for children or grandchildren to learn about it, keep it more to the four foot so they can actually see. As regards nesting boxes, somewhere between six to 12 foot high. If you're like me, you're older, or if your ladder only reaches a certain length, keep it towards that uh, six to eight. I usually go for eight foot, it's a perfect height for me. Also, because it's got to be cleaned out every single winter, you need access. You can't sort of leave it 12 foot high and then forget about it forever. It has to be cleaned out and disinfected every single winter, so you need access. So if that eight foot mark is fine for you, that's fine for the birds. Don't forget about territory. You can put a whole load of nesting boxes on a tree and you're going to attract sparrows because sparrows nest in colonies. They've got no problem whatsoever. Something like blue tits, definitely territorial, so you need to space out those one per tree and space them out. So for me, for the moment, it's bye-bye and I'll see you next week in Grey's Garden. Bye-bye now.